streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and BlastTheRadio.com, this is The Lowell Green Show. The number to call and be heard around the world is 613-413-2217 or email Lowell at BlastTheRadio.com. And now, here is Lowell Green. John, how many of you can remember October 1962? I sure can. I was scared crapless. October 1962. The world teeters on the brink of nuclear war. Missile launch sites have been spotted on Cuba, only a few miles from the U.S. coast. A Russian ship loaded with missiles, perhaps nuclear-tipped, steams towards Cuba. U.S. President Kennedy warns Russia, either turn that ship around or we will attack and we will sink it. The world trembles breathlessly. Children in classrooms across North America are taught how to duck under their desks in the event of nuclear blast. For a month, the standoff continues, but when it becomes apparent that the Americans mean business, that they are ready to risk nuclear war, Russia backs off. The ship turns around, heads back to Russia. We we breathe a little easier. Canada uh, Kennedy called the Russian bluff, and he won. My question today is, should we do the same thing? with a no-fly zone over Ukraine. At the very least, as conservative leader Candace Bergen suggests, should we declare a no-fly zone over escape routes, humanitarian routes? NATO to this point says no. A no-fly zone means we might have to shoot down Russian planes, which might lead to something more severe, a nuclear war. The United States under Kennedy called a Russian bluff, and they backed down. Do you think Putin would do the same thing today? Because, I mean, nuclear war means, among other things, certain destruction of Moscow and virtually every Russian city, and certain death for Putin, and certain death for his generals. Do you really believe that Putin would do it? Do you really believe his generals would let him do it. Generals like to live, too. And by the way, there's every indication that Putin is far from, su- far from suicidal. He apparently enjoys life a great deal. Certainly has the money in which to enjoy. Uh, and, and as for a conventional war, which is probably much more likely with the Russians, what the hell are we afraid of? For three weeks now, the mighty Russian army has been held off by an army just a fraction of that launched by the Russians. NATO is comprised of 30 Western industrialized nations bound by an agreement to defend each other. I mean, if Putin can't conquer Ukraine, what chance would he have in a conventional war against 30 modern industrialized countries? A risk, no doubt. Lives would be lost, no doubt. But is there not a risk involved in standing by while Ukraine is crushed, citizens slaughtered? I mean, among other things, doesn't that send a message to rogue nations like North Korea, China, Iran? All you have to do is threaten nuclear war and the West will chicken out back down. Make no mistake, the world is watching. And much of the world is horrified, including, by the way, we understand many Russians themselves. NATO, including Canada, has the power to end it. Yes, we could. And yes, there would be a risk. But is there not a risk as well in doing nothing and letting a free, democratic, nation be crushed, its citizens slaughtered, hospitals attacked, children killed? 
Is there not a danger in that? And, of course, and I'm sorry to bring this up, but there's also the moral question. Not that morality seems to matter very much in the world today, but maybe there's just a question of doing the right thing. It, I mean, men and women, citizens of virtually every age in the Ukraine are prepared to die to stand up for freedom. We won't take the risk. We'll let them die, apparently. What's your feeling? I know there's a risk, and uh, I know that some of you will say, oh, I'm warmongering, but I, I, I am afraid that there is just as much risk in not doing anything as doing something. And maybe the best compromise of all is a, a no-fly zone, not over all of Ukraine, but over escape routes, some humanitarian corridors. Just tell Putin, listen, we, NATO, are going to declare a no-fly zone over these particular routes to allow innocent citizens to escape. And uh, we're, if, if any Russian plane enters that, we'll shoot it down. I, to me, I think we should, uh, my feeling is, we should at least do that. Call Putin's bluff. But I understand. I understand the reluctance. But if we allow this, what do we allow next? And what about the issue of morality? Can we really? <clears throat> we, we have the power to stop it. They say it might, might expand it, but we have the power to stop it. And we're not using that power. I, I am afraid that that there is a, there is a legitimate concern, and 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 I agree with it. A, 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 excuse me, a legitimate legitimate concern <laughs> uh, that this would just expand the fighting. I understand that, but I I just I I, I just wonder what what we are left with here if we allow Ukraine to be crushed and its people murdered. I just wonder, you know, what we are left here as, as a people, as NATO, as Canada. Your thoughts on this, and by the way, apparently two children suffering from cancer will be airlifted to the Toronto Sick Children's Hospital in the next couple of days from Ukraine. This will be the first Ukrainian refugees allowed into Canada in more than three weeks of terrible war. And by the way, this was not organized by the government. The government is still dragging its feet, insisting on red tape, visas, etc. This, uh, this fly out by, by uh, cancer patients is arranged by the Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, which apparently, I didn't know this, apparently has had an arrangement with Ukraine for some time. They have shared information, and I'm not sure if they have transferred patients back and forth, but all of this was arranged by the Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. The Canadian government, no way. We say we, shan't, we stand shoulder to shoulder, but we won't even allow refugees into the country. Poland is almost two million now, desperate for places to put them. We have, we have thousands of people in our country who are begging for them, saying that they will look after them, provide them food, shelter, etc., etc., but the government still drags its feet. Meantime, uh, now that the weather has warmed up, more people are crossing undocumented at Roxham Road. This is apparently what, what passes for fairness in the liberal world. Uh, John, uh, any response so far? What yes, sir. Saying? Yep, and we invite your calls, of course, at 613-413-2217. You can text that number as well. If you're watching on Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you would ordinarily post your comments, you feel free to do that. We'll pop them up on the screen. And I am here to read as many as I can for you to Lowell. We begin with Kevin on Facebook. He says, yes, and now. Arthur says, it's way too late for NATO and Biden to bluff. Sue, her first time uh, commenting on your show. Welcome, Excuse me, Sue. Hold on just a minute. It's too late? <laughs> too late to bluff. I, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. I, why is it too late to bluff? I mean, the fact of the matter is that 
the world is becoming more and more horrified by what's going on here. And um, NATO can can decide to call their play. I, I, to be honest with you, I think the best idea here is Candace Bergen's idea, and that is declare a no-fly zone over some escape routes, some humanitarian routes. I, I think that Putin would be hard-pressed to start a nuclear war over refusing to allow some escape routes. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I just doubt very much if his own generals would let him do that. Would, are you telling me that you think that that Putin and his generals, the military, the Russian people, would go to nuclear war, risk annihilation, because uh, they wouldn't allow escape routes? I, uh, to me, to me, that might be the best compromise of all. Go ahead, please, John. All right, that comment was from Arthur. Arthur, we uh, invite you to follow up. Uh, Sue, as I was saying, first time comment from you. She says, the question is, if we don't do it now, when will we? I don't want to leave this fight for my children. It needs to be done now. Lori's on Facebook. She says, I don't know the answer, but we can't stand by. It could be us needing help someday. I'm so sick of not doing much. You know, one of the things, John, that, that I am worried about. Now, as I say, I, I understand the primary motivation with NATO is they really do fear uh, an enlargement of the war. I understand that, and they may be right. But there is also an issue that many of these NATO countries, uh, including Canada, by the way, have allowed their military to crumble very badly. As I stated uh, last week, uh, and this is a, a, an absolute fact, the CF-18s, some of which we've sent to Latvia, are now 40 years old, badly outdated. Our tanks are 45 years old. Our frigate that we sent is 30 years old. Our submarines all leak. They, they cannot be submerged. That, that's, that would be our, our contribution to NATO. And it's interesting to see that Germany has realized and already that they've got to really beef up their military. So I'm a little concerned that maybe one of the reasons for the hesitancy on behalf of NATO is, yes, there's a real concern about enlargement. But I think there's also a concern that, geez, do we really have the equipment? Uh, do we have the means to fight Russia right now? I think the the example that we're seeing now, where Russia uh, obviously is not nearly the powerful army that we had suspected. I mean, three weeks now, and they, they, they can't beat Ukraine with an army a fraction of its size. So, But I, I, I just am concerned that that is one of the reasons for the hesitancy is that Many NATO nations, including Canada, realize that they have allowed the military to deteriorate to a point where maybe they they couldn't really put up much of a fight. John, go ahead, please. All right, here's a text at 613-413-2217 from your buddy Barry. He says, the NATO nations in Europe are the ones that should decide. They are the ones that have Putin's Russia right next door. If they want to cover a no-fly zone, it should be the whole country, only a partial zone, would be condoning the rest of Putin's actions. If NATO, Europe wants it, the U.S. and Canada should be there too. Uh, again, the number here is 613-413-2217. I just want to point out something. Thank you, Barry. It's a good, it's a good point. Um, uh, if NATO is involved then Canada is involved. That is, the under, that, that is the reason for NATO. NATO is a group of 30 nations, Western nations, which have signed on to an agreement that, in essence, an attack on one is deemed to be an attack on them all. This was designed as a protection against Russian aggression. That's why it exists. So I just want to point out that Europe couldn't do this in isolation because Canada is a member of NATO. Now, mind you, what Canada could contribute, uh, certainly our, our fighting men and women are, are wonderful. We saw that in Afghanistan. No matter where we go and what, what war is involved, the Canadian troops punch well above their weight. But we have so badly left them uh, with su such poor equipment, such outdated equipment. I mean, it's all very well. You've got wonderful and well-trained soldiers. But if we don't have bullets for their guns, which actually, by the way, happened in Afghanistan. Go ahead, John. Uh, Arthur is following up on his comment that we addressed earlier. He says, Khrushchev didn't know what Kennedy would do. Putin won't believe a threat now coming from NATO or Biden since they have refused no-fly zones or supplying planes to Ukraine. That's his follow-up. Okay, well, that's, uh, that, that's uh, I, I don't believe that. I think that, that if, if, the, if NATO declared that they were going to back up a no-fly zone, I think Putin would take it very seriously. 
Uh, I mean, that, that's the reason that they're hesitant to do. They feel that Putin would take it seriously and start a nuclear war. Go ahead, John. Uh, we've got a phone call coming in. I haven't had a chance to screen it yet, but let's go to the phone. Hi, can I get your name, please? Good afternoon, John. It's Jace. <laughs> we've heard Hello, of you. Jace. Go ahead, Jace. You're on live with Lowell. Jace, 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 my hero. Jace actually phoned his MP and demanded that we bring the refugees in now. Yes, Jace, what's on your mind today? Um, first of all, Zelensky's address to Parliament yesterday. Yes. Um, the Speaker of the Senate said something that kind of stuck with me, and it was, uh, there's a Jewish word or expression, and the translation roughly is, here I stand. Yes. Suggesting that we stand with Ukraine, and we will. And I don't see us as Canada doing that. It's more like, here we stand. Because we're Uh, not standing with Ukraine. We're standing stuff over. And I do agree with you. We do need to put an end to this, and we need to do it very quickly. If we take a look back in history, if the if the nations of the world stepped in when Hitler took over Poland, we could have stopped him then. We would have saved millions of lives. Instead, actually, we actually, left him in Poland. Well, actually, we did step in when he, when he attacked Poland. But we, we should have stepped in when he attacked uh, Czechoslovakia. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Good point. Good point. So I understand. If we, if we had done that then, we, we would have, we, and, and we need to do this now. If, if Vladimir Putin is allowed to run over Ukraine, even though they're putting up a hell of a fight, I mean, if all of Russia's forces come in there, I'm afraid for Ukraine as a country. They, they, they're going to get blown to smithereens. Maybe they're, I mean, he's never going to win their hearts. There's always going to be factions that are going to be fighting, but like he, he will be stronger for it because of their natural resources. Nothing's going to stop him from taking over another country. He could aim for Georgia or Kazakhstan or just about anything he decides. Well, he's and already taken over willing, Georgia. Uh, no, let me, let me, let me just, you, you make some, Jace, let me, let me make a point here. Um, somehow or other, we seem to be under the assumption that if Putin wins and defeats and pretty well destroys Ukraine, that it's over. That's, it's not over. Uh, you, the, very clearly, the Ukrainian people will continue to fight, at, you know, guerrilla warfare. So what we're looking at, even if Putin wins now or appears to win, we are looking at years of guerrilla warfare, which that in itself may drag other nations in Europe into it. So this idea that somehow or other Putin will win and it'll be all over, it's not over. It just actually, no. if Putin wins, it gets worse over there. Go ahead. 100%. I agree, 100%. And if NATO, NATO was formed for exactly this purpose. Now, I understand Ukraine isn't part of NATO. I understand that, but like NATO as a group ha- holds sway on things because of the might of the group together. Yes. And if we're not willing to call that into action and say, this is the way it is, then really NATO is nothing but a bunch of old men meeting on a regular basis and having tea on a Wednesday afternoon. Thank you for your call. Very good call, Jace. Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, a word now about our good friends up in Pakenham. Shields. Now, here, here is a place, as I've mentioned many times before, started right after the Second World War. 1947, the grandfather, then the father took over, and now the son, Mark Shield. Um, and the same spot in, in, uh, in Pakenham. Now, they've got a huge warehouse. All of the, all of the I think people think because it's in, in Pakenham, small town, that somehow or other they won't have the selection. They do. All of the major brands, including some of the minor brands, by the way, very interesting, very fair pricing, delivery within two or three days. You won't have a long wait. And uh, once again, you know, we're talking about good people, local people, Canadians. Keep your money in Canada. Keep it local if you can. And with Shields, you sure can. Shields.ca. John, what else have we got here? 
All right, Tom says, Candace and you are right on, Lowell. Gregory says, Canada must mobilize our army and logistical abilities immediately. Cut a deal with the Yanks and get missiles, drones, and lots of ammo. Sue's back. She says, well, that's an interesting thought. If you think the reason NATO isn't getting involved is because we aren't ready, that's some scary shit for Ukraine and democracy. Glenn says, Lowell, you have just eloquently expanded upon what Canada possesses in military strength, and yet you state that we must get engaged. So who is the we? This needs clarification. If we is Canada well, what, alone... Well, then... Hold it, hold it, hold it. What, what, I mean, what planet do you live on? How many times have we said NATO? NATO, N-A-T-O. NATO is a group of 30 Western nations standing together. 30 nations, including Canada. That's what we're talking about. How people can can be confused about that just beats the bejesus out of me. Go ahead, John. All right. Tony is on Facebook. He says, isn't it obvious that until communism is stomped out completely, then this threat, whether Russian or Chinese, will always be there. So let's do it. Let's go all in for once and for all. Let's wipe out communism, fascism from the face of the earth. Short-term pain for long-term gain. Billions will die. Well, we're not going to wipe out communism. I mean, we're not going to wipe out China here. That's for sure. But uh, it, the issue, I don't think, is communist. I mean, Russia is not a communist nation today, uh, despite some appearances. But um, the, the, I, I just go, I go back to the fact that we're under this misapprehension that if Putin wins, that it's over. It's, it's not. It, Guerrilla warfare will grind on for years. It'll take far more lives. And I fear that with guerrilla warfare, other nations may be dragged in. Go ahead, John. I think you're right. Ukraine is just the appetizer, really. A couple of questions uh, in a similar vein. Uh, Brian asks this, and so does Robert. This war has confirmed to me one thing for sure. The UN has once again proved useless and should be disbanded. Turn the building in New York into another Trump hotel. And Brian says, where is the UN on this war? Well, the UN has, uh, almost unanimously, um, I think there were five abstentions, and of course Russia voted against it, condemned the war. Now, for whatever whatever value there is in that, but I mean, the the weapon that we have here is called NATO. Thirty nations, industrialized Western nations, bound together with a hidebound agreement, saying an attack on one is an attack on us all. That's that's the weapon that we have. Go ahead, please. All right, back to Facebook. Ann says, Putin is destroying Ukraine, and the longer this goes on, there will be no Ukraine left. Action by NATO is required now. Robert on Facebook, Trudeau's lack of support for Ukrainian immigrants is despicable. Start the airlift now. Do not let Trudeau near them when they arrive. None of his phony photo ops will be believed. You know, I'm very interesting. I was watching one of the television channels, and they interviewed a couple of former uh, army generals. Um, I think one of the, one of them was Rick Hillier. I'm not sure. Rick is a, is a good friend of mine. I'm not sure if it was Rick who said it, but one of them said, you know, send over. And he was, he, he was very adamant. We've got to send far more things. And he said, and by the way, when we unload all of the goods over there, let's load them up with refugees and bring them here for God's sake. And I, that's the first time I've heard anybody say this. Aside from Lowell Green and and John Milkey, <laughs> you know, like and some callers here, I mean, you're right. We're sending planes over there, and they're flying back empty for God's sake. Meantime, people are sleeping in doorways, and now in in Poland, they're so desperate, they're talking about getting sh some shipping containers for people to live in. These are for the most part women and children, and we can't bring them here. Go ahead, John. Uh, Ann says that was Fraser. Was it Fraser? Apparently. Okay, thank you. According thank you. Uh, Murray says Canada should not be in NATO because they have not been contributing. Otherwise, he says, we would have equipment in order to protect our own country. Uh, Robert says Kamala Harris incorrectly stated that Ukraine was a member of NATO. Okay. Uh, Angie says exactly that. Bring them back to Canada. Cheryl on Facebook says it's almost like NATO thinks that someone else will help. I'm afraid we don't. I'm afraid we don't, Lowell. Totally agree with you. We need to get off our asses because if we don't, we're, we're all going to in same boat as Ukraine right now because Putin will come after our natural resources as well. 
Wayne, I believe this is the first time you've posted. Welcome to the show, Wayne, and thank you for your comment. He says, I say put a price on Putin, and some head military people get rid of the problem. Shirley says, Justin must have a stockpile of slingshots somewhere. This is sad. Sean, uh, this is a test for NATO to show it has teeth or it is just a useless organization like the United Nations. Heard from a friend in Nicopol this morning. Her and her family are okay, and she says they will beat the Russians. Uh, they, they may, but they may not. But if they do beat the Russians, I mean, I don't know what's going to be left of the country. I mean, very clearly the Russians. As long as the Russians have an open skies, which is essentially what they have, um, then nothing can stop them. I mean, artillery, planes, they can just send in planes and, and bomb every city into dust. And frankly, it would appear that Putin is prepared to do that, just reduce the country to dust. Um, uh, go ahead, John, please. Yeah, I like Ukraine's chances if it's a fight in the streets, but without air support, I think they, they are in deep trouble. Ray says, maybe Putin doesn't want a lot of NATO countries surrounding him. Uh, Mike says, if things continue the way they are, we won't have a choice here. Gregory, good day, Lowell. The only ones who can stop war in Ukraine are the Russians. It's up to the rest of us to end it. Rick says, NATO is useless unless we are ready to go all the way. North Korea and other two-bit belligerents can't back their threats, but Russia can. Uh, Joshua, I don't think we've heard from you yet today. He says, we've become, in general, a risk-averse society. War is a grave risk, a last resort, but if we do not stand for the democracy of others, how secure is democracy at the problem, <clears throat> A very good point. The problem here is war has come to us. Uh, we, we didn't go to war. Uh, the war has come to us, whether we like to admit it or not. Uh, a fellow Western democratic nation, uh, a, a democracy, as, is under attack and going to be destroyed. War has come to us. Go ahead, please. Brian asks, is it possible to send peacekeepers in from the UN to at least try to save lives? Well, in order to have peacekeepers, you got to have peace, and there's no peace in Ukraine. Go ahead, please. A text at 613-413-2217. All democratic countries should only trade with each other and let communist countries trade between themselves. Why should we continue to support their world domination ideals and their lack of human rights? Well, that's a very good question. One of the problems, of course, in Europe, and we've talked about this, I think most people understand, is, and the, the green energy people have got to accept a lot of the blame. Europe, along with Canada, decided, certainly Ontario, decided several years ago that they were going to go green with energy. And so uh, they, and in the case of Germany, they, they decommissioned nuclear plants, which is, you know, they totally emission free, et cetera. And they closed down glass, gas plants, et cetera, and thought that they could rely on, on uh, essentially wind and solar. Well, it didn't work. So as a consequence, they had to turn to Russia, the only place that still is smart enough, and that's true, to not only, not only produce, drill for oil and gas, but actually pipe it to nations that want it. So in the case of Germany and several other European nations, uh, 40 to 50 percent of their oil and gas comes from Russia. Why? Well, because they couldn't produce it themselves because they shut down means to produce it. Go ahead. Uh, Sue says, I say we call Putin's bluff and focus on the future of our children for our children's sake. They are more concerned about having fresh water in 20 years. Russia will have lots like Canada. What then? Mike says, China watching how the world reacts to Putin. I think they will think twice before invading Taiwan and seeing how we all put to, we all pull together. That's why I think we should act now. Toot sweet, says Mike. Donald says, no fly zone over all Ukraine, then send in all NATO forces. Kerry says, call his bluff. So true. How can we just stand by here? Uh, three or four more comments to wrap things up here, Lowell. Here we go. Shirley says, is doing nothing, not telling Putin, do what you wish, and how far will he go next? Good question. I believe there is still morality out there. Glenn you know, there's not, let me just jump in here. Of course. Um, it's, it's not only that we refuse to Im implement a no-fly zone. We also refuse to even send Ukraine the jets so that they can fight off the Russians. Um, as you know, Poland offered to ship uh, I'm sorry, ship planes into Russia, uh, I'm sorry, into Ukraine, and uh, the Americans were going to replace them. But now 
NATO has decided, no, even that's too dangerous. So not only will NATO not declare a no-fly zone, it won't even provide the jets so that the Ukrainians can free up their own airspace. Go ahead, please, John. All right. Uh, let me see. Boris is begging the Saudis for oil. And Gregory says the Yanks are sending drones in now. And finally, Peter says some billionaire Ru in Russia is saying the U.S. needs to give back Alaska to Russia. Give Putin an inch and he takes a mile. We didn't stop Hitler till it was almost too late. History repeats itself. Well, I, I just want to remind you that Alaska is American territory. Go ahead. <laughs> That's all the comments we've got for today, Mr. Lowell all Green. Right. Well, listen, thank you very much. Thank you, Walt. And uh, very interesting. There, apparently there is a poll out which surprises me, indicates that about three-quarters of Canadians say, you know what, take the risk. Call Putin's bluff, go in and at least declare a no-fly zone. Thank you all. We'll be back. Uh, we won't be back tomorrow, by the way. I have a, a meeting uh, with the Heart Institute. So we'll Four, be back 14 at... degrees tomorrow, and you're you're taking a sick day. Uh -huh. uh, no, it's Smart. not a sick day. Sure, Lowell. Sure. <laughs> no, they had, to, they had to install a new pacemaker <laughs> because one of the – when I when I fell and broke my hip, I also, believe it or not, broke one of the lines into my heart from the oh. pacemaker. And so they had to install a new pacemaker. So this is just a checkup. Seems to be working good. I'm still breathing. Thank Excellent. you all. We'll be back on Friday. The Lowell Green Show is seen and heard live around the world at 2 p.m. Eastern. Connect with us online at blasttheradio.com slash Lowell Green. Can't join us live? Download the Lowell Green Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and more. Ask your smart speaker to play the Lowell Green Podcast. This is a production of BlastTheRadio.com.